Uh, another thing, uh, even more important uh, to consider here, is that states actively make and keep people poor. Poverty is not just some random thing that happens that the state then comes along to remedy. Uh, the state, uh, to use, uh, I don't actually remember now whose uh, uh, metaphor this is, uh, but the state breaks your leg and then offers you a crutch. Uh, the fact is that licensing laws, uh, zoning regulations, and similar restrictions make it hard for people, poor people, to enter particular job markets and to operate businesses out of their homes. Uh, without the state to put these kinds of restrictions in place, uh, people would be less likely to be poor. The state is an active enemy of poor people in this way. Uh, related to this is the fact that states raise the cost of being poor. Uh, building codes and zoning regulations um, boost the uh, price of housing, and so they make it harder for people to find inexpensive homes. Uh, these building codes are designed for the benefit often of the construction industry, uh, the major players in that industry, uh, not the small ones, uh, and uh, certainly not for the benefit very often of poor people. Uh, some people are forced to live without permanent housing at all, uh, while other people uh, can spend uh, you know, much larger fractions of their income on housing than they otherwise would. The idea here is you basically have the choice uh, either to eat, if you're, an, if you're a meat eater, think about it in these terms, I'm not. Uh, you can either have an expensive steak or you can have nothing. You don't have the option of, uh, of a hamburger. So agricultural uh, tariffs uh, also uh, make the uh, cost of being poor higher. Uh, food is the most significant portion, obviously, of anybody, anybody's budget. Without food, uh, none of us gets anywhere. Uh, and agricultural tariffs uh, certainly uh, boost uh, the price of food. Without the state uh, to make meeting their basic needs unnecessarily expensive, poor people would certainly have more disposable income and would be more economically secure. Now, states actively take money from poor people. Let's remember this. In addition to raising the cost of being poor, they actually take money from people. Uh, David Friedman calculated, certainly in the 70s, that uh, many people, uh, poor people pay more in taxes than they get back in services under the state's rule. Not everybody, but many do. These people would have more resources net in the absence of the state's demand for tax money. Uh, here's another thing to recognize. Uh, I think the concern about the availability of state support often presupposes that poverty relief wouldn't happen without the state. And I think this is just false, and it's fairly obvious uh, that it's false if you think about it. So first of all, support for poverty relief doesn't just come from tax funds now. Clearly, people uh, uh, donate money directly to uh, charities that serve poor people, and there's no reason to think that nobody would somehow support poverty relief absent the state. I mean, the fact is, people give money to charitable causes over and above their tax bills today, uh, despite the huge sums that the state claims from them. So there's no reason to think they wouldn't do so in a stateless society. Um, another point that's related is that I, it's just naive to suppose that the wealthy and powerful are opposed to state funding for services to the poor at present. Why is it naive? Because the fact is, if the wealthy and powerful were implacably opposed to it, it wouldn't happen. The poor have far less clout than the wealthy and powerful do, and yet the state provides minimal services for poor people. Uh, there is no reason, I think, to suppose that wealthy and well-connected people uh, who are willing to uh, see the state do this uh, wouldn't also be willing uh, to see uh, not their tax money in the absence of the state, but their direct contributions uh, used to support uh, services for the poor. If they're willing to do that under the state, if they're willing that their tax money be spent that way, it seems most unlikely that they wouldn't be willing to see that without the state. I mean, you have to ask, why do people give money to good causes, uh, including uh, a voluntary programs, certainly, that uh, that help the poor. Why do wealthy and well-connected people make contributions um, to such programs? Why do they endorse state spending on programs uh, that provide services to poor people? And I think presumably, and obviously we need more empirical evidence here, but presumably there's a combination of reasons for this, uh, including, and this is just you know, something I, a set of options I offer in no particular order, uh, there's compassion. Obviously some people will give or support uh, uh, payments uh, out of compassion. Social norms, other people expect you to do this and you just internalize this sense that this is what the right thing to do is. Uh, there's the desire for a good reputation. There's the desire to avoid a bad reputation. And of course, it's just the desire to avoid social disorder. Uh, and this is clearly, clearly important. Folks are worried that if there's no support for uh, angry poor people, uh, they're gonna start uh, tearing the walls down. Now, the fact is all of these reasons would be operative in a stateless society just as they're operative in, in our society. Here's another point. 
in a stateless society, uh, less money would be spent obtaining key services. So obviously without the state, there wouldn't be taxes and what are now state provided services would be available on the market and thus in most cases less expensively. The state does a whole range of things, uh, notably uh, you know, requiring professional licenses, uh, requiring hospital accreditation, I'm focusing on healthcare here, uh, uh, prescriptions, uh, enforcing uh, drug and medical device patent rules and, and so forth. Uh, I'm focusing on healthcare because healthcare is such an important part of most uh, people's, uh, people's uh, budgeting. Um, and they make particular services, but the state therefore makes particular services like these uh, especially expensive. Without state interference, it seems quite clear that these services would be less expensive and therefore more available. Uh, the state uh, uh, drives up these prices monopolistically. In addition, uh, some services, think about a, a bloated military, wouldn't be part of the picture at all, so people wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be forced to pay for these. So the fact is that people would have more disposable income than at present. This means uh, both that people with limited incomes would be better able to uh, take care of themselves, and that people with more money uh, would have uh, bigger disposable incomes, and uh, therefore it would be easier for them uh, to provide support for uh, uh, of a range of good causes. And again, I just want to emphasize, it's important to recall that lots of people do this today even while they're paying taxes. So I think there's just no reason at all to suppose they wouldn't do it in the absence of the state. And indeed, I think there's good reason to think they might be more willing to. So the absence of the state would make everyone richer. Um, you know, one, one critic of my ideas on, on this front said that uh, all I was really saying over and over again was a rising tide lifts all boats, and that's not true. I have, uh, I've said, I think, a range of other things about quite specific ways in which the state uh, is an enemy of poor people and makes poor people's lives difficult, and in which the, uh, ways in which the state makes it difficult for people to uh, uh, provide uh, uh, the kind of help that they might like to because it takes their money for other purposes. But it is certainly right that the absence of the state would make everyone richer. This is a rising tide lifting all boats. The state's subsidies and regulations drive down the overall productivity of the economy. The state allocates resources inefficiently. So there is good reason to believe that in its absence, people uh, of all kinds, including members of the working poor, would be wealthier on average than they are today. This means both that poor people would have more money and that those in a position to help them would too. Just worth underscoring this basic point. The state is bad for overall economic productivity. Another thing to recognize is the availability of mutual aid networks and the effectiveness of mutual aid networks. I mean, these could provide many of the services well-intentioned statists want the state to offer. Um, societies in which people pooled risk and provided pensions and health care and other services, these kinds of societies functioned quite effectively before the rise of state uh, uh, social services. And uh, you know, I encourage you to check out uh, David Beto's book, uh, B-E-I-T-O, David Beto's book uh, for Mutual Aid to the Welfare State. Uh, you can check out some briefer articles. For instance, uh, uh, Roderick Long has a great piece um, called something like uh, um, you know, universal health care that worked until, uh, until government killed it, uh, and so forth. Uh, there's a great deal of stuff that, uh, that highlights uh, just how effective these alternatives were. The fact is that uh, official uh, sources of authority within the medical community certainly didn't like the idea of providing uh, uh, health care in this way. What often happened was that mutual aid networks would hire physicians in what came to be called lodge practice, and lodge practice turned out to be bad news for the medical establishment because it meant that the cost of medical care went down, the incomes of physicians went down, and so of course they didn't like it very much. Um, so in any event, uh, mutual aid networks, I think, uh, have to be seen as capable of providing effective low-cost alternatives.